I also asked um, Rebecca Drummond, our grant writer, to be on the call if she could because I just wanted her to, we want to see if we can get maybe um, kind of a small group of us, and we did talk about this at the steering committee um, on the 8th uh, to see if we could just kind of get a small group of us together to talk grants so we actually have the whole year to, to get it together so we're not doing it at the last minute. Um, and I think that would give us a better chance at actually getting some of the grant money that's out there and available. So I know that Joseph Ray said that he'd be willing to be part of that. Um, so you can kind of keep that on the on your thoughts. You know, if that's something you might be able to help us with. Deb, I did reach out to the. Uh, assisted living administrator at Isleta, and um, she's currently out for she has a death in her family. So I'm going to follow up with her next, maybe next week or the week after. Oh, that's nice. Okay, now that give me the name of that. I know it's near Albuquerque, right? It is. It's just a little south of Albuquerque. Isleta Pueblo is. Can you spell that for me? I S L E T A. Okay, and what what is her name again? Natalie Abeda. A B E T A. E I A B E I T A. Okay, perfect. All right, that would be great. Um, I definitely want assisted living, um, and we have had some um, um, luck with um, in Alaska uh, with. Um, Oh, Melissa, who, um, what's her name? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Agnes Feaster. Agnes, yeah, Agnes, um, Sweetster? Sweet, yeah, Sweet 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 yeah, Sweetster. She, um, had been on her, our call a couple times, um, and so we were really, really pleased to have her. And I know that Teresa Holt, the ombudsman for Alaska, um, has wanted to be on these calls too, but she has a conflicting call, I guess, kind of at the same time. Um, so, you know, she said she'd do her best. Um, we've also had our ombudsman from here at Archie, Elizabeth, Jose on a few of these calls too, so. Is, is everyone getting, now, Shirley, you're still not getting your, um, newsletter and your invite, your reminder a week ahead of time? I didn't get it, no. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been checking my email. Um, Shirley, can you, you and Jonathan please make sure that Sheila, so it's um, S. Wiggins, W-I-G-G-I-N-S, at T-O-L-T-C dot O-R-G, because she's here right now, so it's the same as mine. It's just her first initial last name. If she could mm -hmm. make sure she gets on our Unite list, and then also Rick Richards, who's also our current administrator. So R. Richards with an S, at T-O-L-T-C dot O-R-G. We need to make sure they both are getting the newsletters and the invites for these. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll check right now. Okay. All right, good. Did anyone else join the call? Because we're going to get started otherwise, because it's already after 12. Did anyone else join the call? It's 12.08. Okay. I'm sure Dr. Lewis uh, will be joining, but let me just double-check my email, because I usually get some last-minute emails. Um, I'm glad that the call never worked well. We did get the time straightened out. I thank KAI for doing that um, uh, so that we know what they did. Anyone have trouble calling in today? Mm -hmm. I did. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. So always remember... Um, that then I'll let KAI give their updates because we've made some changes to our website also. Please remember that um, now you're getting a reminder for this call, which is always the third Thursday of the month um, at noon Arizona time, so it's 2 Eastern, 2 Eastern. So when the time changes again, it'll be 3 Eastern. So it'll either be 2 Eastern or 3 Eastern. <laughs> That's what we decided. <laughs> and then, um, so... It's always the third Thursday. So the second Thursday is when our newsletter is going to come out. And that will be your reminder for this call. And then um, 
the deadline for the newsletter, if you want KAI to send out anything to this group, is the, always the first Wednesday of the month. So, so every month we kind of have like the first Wednesday of the month, and then we have the, the, the next week probably the reminder email will go out. And then we have our hearing committee call the second Monday. And then the third Thursday is our monthly call. And then remember that there's the long-term support service webinar, which is always the fourth Wednesday. And we just really encourage everyone to be on that webinar, which I know, Julie, you can just kind of mention that when we give your report. So, um, we did have a steering committee call um, on the 8th. And, Julie, the reason you don't have the minutes for it is I'm still looking for my notes. <laughs> I know. They're somewhere. <laughs> I will find them. Um, I pretty re pretty much remember, though, the call pretty well. Um, so Dr. Blythe Winchester was on that call, and I'm really pleased to say I was really pleased to have her on the call. And um, she did mention that she's currently serving. I'll just bring this up right now, although it's kind of new business. But there's going to be a... Um, Shoot, it, some of you might know David or Dave Baldrich. He's the executive director for the International Association for Indigenous Aging. Does anyone know Dave? Mm. No. Okay, so Julie, I will be forwarding you this updated um, letter he sent me. So there's going to be a 90-minute Native Alzheimer's consultation call, the virtual call on February 5th, which is would be it's a Monday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, okay? And so they are inviting us because Dr. Winchester served on this group, so she told them about our collaborative, and they are actually inviting us as part of a select audience of tribal urban health directors who are asked to participate in the call. And so this is a partnership between the Center for Disease Prevention, CDC Prevention, and Alzheimer's Association, and this is part of that Healthy Brain Initiative. So you may be familiar with HBI, the Healthy Brain Initiative. And so it says a key part of this initiative has been the completion of two five-year national roadmaps. A third roadmap for 2018 to 2023 is being developed, and it includes the first-ever Indian country roadmap. And so they want us to be basically giving them input as to what should be on this roadmap, okay, which is really exciting. Um, and so um, the call, again, that says share your successes, challenges, experiences, and ideas with this group. And the Life Winchester is part of this group. Um, she's actually on this call. We'll be doing a presentation along with um, uh, Dr. Neil Henderson, uh, who is um, the Professor of Biobehavioral Health and Population Sciences at the University of Minnesota Medical School. So I'm going to be sending out this updated letter. I just got it this morning from David uh, Dave Baldridge. And so if you're interested, if you're part of this group, you're welcome. And you can... I don't... <laughs> It looks like you still need to register for the call, but that is the time. It is going to be Monday, February 5th, and it is going to be at 1, 1 30 Eastern, okay? So, um, I don't know, Julie, we, we can't really wait to send this out, so I'm thinking we may need to do a mailing uh, about this, okay? So, okay. All right, so let me just, I, sorry, I got a little bit out of order there, but I didn't want to forget that, um, but that, that's really important. Um, has anyone else joined the call? I have Jonathan, Melissa, Sheila, Julie, anyone else, and myself? All right. All right, so... Um, let me just see here. We'll do an administrator. Well, let's just, uh, let me just look here. We, last time on the call, we had Kristen Hutchins. I also wanted to give you one other update. She's with the office, uh, Administration on Community Living, um, and we did decide at our steering committee meeting on January um, 8th that we would have our annual meeting 
as part of that 40th anniversary celebration and conference for the Title VI program, the long-term support services. So I still need to get a hold of Kristen uh, or Cynthia LeCount to see exactly the dates on that. Melissa, you didn't hear anything else on that, did you? No, I did not. Um, okay, so we'll get the date. This, this, this is Julie. Um, Kristen emailed me actually to let me know that she wasn't available to be on the call today. Um, but she did mention that the conference would be held in August, but she didn't have specific dates yet. Okay. So that's what we're kind of waiting for because we're going to go ahead and do our annual meeting as part of that. Uh, we made that decision. So based on different factors. So, um, and that's their Title VI conference, right? Correct. Right. And that is their 40th anniversary conference, and I'm pretty sure it's in Minneapolis. Is that correct? Or, or they don't know yet. Um, yeah, I don't know if they know yet. Okay. All right. All right. That's fine. Sorry. Bear with me because I'm typing minutes at the same time. <laughs> All right. I'll one stone. Okay. So let's get some updates. Um, Melissa, do you want to give us a little updates from Alaska and the Rural Elder Services Network meeting that you had sent information about? Um, I currently don't have any updates at this time, Debbie. Okay. So is that we can, we got the date straightened out though on that um, one meeting, right? Yes, it's, um, oh, I don't have it on my calendar, but it's the second week in April here in Anchorage. Yeah. So there was, they're going to have a speaker, Jack, Dr. Jackie Gray, with the National Indigenous Elder Justice, Justice Initiative. Um, it's a special day, a couple days, positive outcomes for Alaska Native elders. And so initially we thought it was going to be in February, but it's actually going to be in April. So that information has been updated and will come out in our um, in our next newsletter that comes out for anyone who wants to be part of that. So, but it is in Anchorage, right? Yes. Okay. Is have you heard anything from Val and the whole seal oil or the traditional food? Anything with that? I have not heard from Val. Okay. Has anyone heard from Val at all? Nope. Okay. Okay. All right. So no other updates, Melissa. No. Um I know we talked about some of the um concerns with dementia and alcohol and uh, some of the issues with staffing capacity, hiring a staff, that type of thing. Um, on our last call, that was on our December call. Uh, administrator's report, I guess, Sheila, that would probably be you. Is there anything that you could share with us that might be helpful to everybody else? Uh, hmm. No, just, you know, um, just trying to prepare and be ready for all the new rules and Mm-hmm. Yeah, educating the staff and um, that's really <laughs> sorry. Okay. Um, Julie, did the did, did the best practice report on disasters that that still was not on the CMS website? Correct. It's it's um, it's not on the CMS website yet. It's still undergoing five hundred eight compliance. Okay. So. Deb, I will say, you know, I wanted to just kind of make a statement that I think that some of the nursing homes on tribal land may be faced with, and I don't know, um, I guess it's a question, like what, what we are at Archie Hendricks being so isolated and, you know, how how do they deal with disaster preparedness when there's limited uh, support from the local governments, you know, either the county or the city government, so... It's, I think that's some of the challenges that we probably face at Archie Hendricks. And um, so I just didn't know if other nursing homes had that same type of challenge, um, you know, throughout the country. 
I know that, um, well, Melissa, you can maybe respond to that a little bit, but I know that when Agnes was on the call that time talking about disasters, um, you know, again, she just talked about that whole concept of, you know, readiness and, you know, having the plan and basically following it. And I know that some of our staff um, went to um, the, when the leading age had their national, you know, conference, I think it was in New Orleans last fall, and they came back and talked about some of the nursing homes who, you know, they were so impressed that they just had everything nailed down. I mean, in terms of, you know, people knew exactly, okay, if this happens, we do this, and here's how that goes. And, you know, it's not to say that, you know, because I know that I've gotten some feedback from different people that, you know, we're like, well, you know, almost like we can just wing it, you know. And I'm <laughs> like, well, no, that's not a best practice. It, it, you know, it, in truth, you can have something written down and maybe you don't follow it exactly to the letter. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that you just throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, you've got to have a plan and really talk through, you know, how do we communicate? You know, what tools are we going to use? Um you know, how does that look for us? What if, you know, kind of goes go through the what if this doesn't happen the way we think it's going to happen. You know, what if our plan is to evacuate to the school and that's the day that, oh, over winter break where the school is closed for two weeks, you know, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, you can think that all through. So I don't know if anyone has any comments. Julie, did that come up when you did those interviews with the with, you know, the people you interviewed for the best practice report, did that come up? Yeah, for um, for the folks that we interviewed, there were five nursing homes. For the most part, everyone did state that they had a plan in place and that they do uh, do trainings on the plan um, to make sure or mock evaluation or mock evacuations and that they also meet up with folks in the community, and they do have either MOUs or partners um, that will assist the nursing home during um, an emergency if there needs to be an evacuation or other thing. Um, so, you know, some of them did talk about, uh, you know, limited resources. Others talked about their partnerships. So I think you get a full sense of, you know, you know a general lay of the land in regards to emergency preparedness in nursing homes. Yeah. Julie, yeah. Ms. Sheila, and, and I think you interviewed me or someone from your staff did, mm-hmm. I can't remember, but, um, you know, of all the nursing homes on tribal land, are, are, are most of them within a close proximity of a, a, a city or a major metropolitan area, or is it, are they pretty much odd, kind of like, like we are at Archie Hendricks, and to a certain extent, Laguna, you know, we were 45 miles from uh, Albuquerque. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of them, I, I want to say most of them, uh, to all, were, are relatively isolated uh, rural, you know, facilities. And so, um, you know, I think one one nursing home in Washington worked with, you know, a school in the next city or mm-hmm. um, something along those lines. So it was a matter of, you know, going out to the next available place or working within. But I think Archie Hendricks was, you know, the most isolated. Um, yeah. So you Definitely facing a unique situation in that regard. So most it seems like most. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty and that's what the nation provides, what kind of services they provide, you know. Uh, right. So you pretty much are... Go ahead. Great. So that's usually, the Sheila, the Office of Emergency Management, correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, we had that at Laguna, and I, I'm not, I don't know what they had at Archie Hendricks and other other uh, places, but yeah, you pretty much relying on what what is available on your on your reservation. Okay. Right, because I know when we had our disaster meetings here, that some of the staff, you know, it was kind of like they looked to the to the tribe to kind of, you know, like, oh, well, they will come and take care of us, kind of thing. Yeah, and I yeah. Said, well, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, you're going to be, you have to have a plan to initially respond to what's going on, right? 
And, you know, recently at Laguna, we had a, we had a water outage for like up to four, one, three and a half days. And, and it was so important for us to be able to communicate with the tribe because they're not only servicing us, they're servicing, you know, the whole reservation and, and the, the houses and, and, and the, you know, the schools and the other clinics on, on, on the land. And so it was just real important for us to be able to communicate with them. Um, and uh, I, uh, and I, you know, I learned that during that particular disaster that they have, they have a mechanism for email alerts from the tribe. So, you know, it's these small little things that you don't think about until you're actually faced with it. That that's why that plan could be can be so overwhelming if if you let it be. You know, but you've got to know what you have at hand. That's my opinion. Mm-hmm. You have to you have to dig and ask questions. You can't just be satisfied with well, I think because that's not going to work in an emergency, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it could be a water outage, or it could be a fire, it could be you know whatever. But it's our, a uh, you know, one example when I went to training of a an actual disaster was you know it could be a. A huge, uh, you know, for instance, sexual harassment claim that was going to affect the whole operation, you know, with how to handle complaints and, and questions and, you know, are you following your policy? So it, it, it could be, a, it could, it can go all over the place as far as what a disaster or emergency could be construed as. Mm-hmm. I have a really quick question for everyone. Did anyone join the call, by the way? Did anyone join the call? Okay, I was at, um, for those of you on the call, I was at an OSHA one-day conference yesterday up in Phoenix. And so I asked her, I had a question, even the OSHA trainers didn't have a good answer. Has anyone ever had OSHA show up at their tribal nursing home? Uh, Has anyone had any kind of inspection? But, okay. you, know, you know, OSHA can definitely go into any nursing home. I don't know about on tribal nursing homes. Well, well, they according to the OSHA.gov, because we went online and looked, there's a letter there, but it's dated back in the early 90s where a tribe actually asked this question. And they said that I just was going to share this because I had gotten varying opinions during the time I've worked here. But they said that from the OSHA's perspective, from the federal government's perspective, and it could be different for the state plan because Arizona is one of the states that have, like, a state OSHA plan. But they said they would treat anyone who worked, you know, on a reservation just like a private sector, you know, just like they would treat anyone that worked in the private sector. So, oh, interesting. and there is some documentation on OSHA.gov that pertains to that, but that's, that was the answer I got, so I just wanted to share that because yeah. that was... <laughs> You know, like filling out your 300 log and 300A and 301, that unless you're exempt, which nursing homes aren't, under the North American industry exemptions, that we would actually, you know, all those things need to be done. But that's for another day, but I just thought I would throw that in there. Um, Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Yeah, Sheila, thank you. Those Those are really good comments. The other thing... That happened yesterday. We were at a hotel in Phoenix. This is just an example of why you have a plan and why you drill. Um, we were in this little conference room, and the fire alarm went off in the middle of the afternoon. And so we all got up. We, we dutifully walked out the door that said exit, because that's the door we had been going out, down this little outside, you know, pathway to get to the bathroom. So we kept going and ended up out in this. It looked like a big playground. It's where the pool was and the picnic areas and the playground for the kids. And so we're just all standing out there, and the lady from the front, the manager, comes out, and she goes, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She goes, you all need to come back in and go out the front door. (laughs) So what happened is where we went out, a marked exit, there was no way to get out of that. We would have, if there had been a fire, we would have been caught back there. It it was like, man, so we actually had to go back through the building, go out the front door, cross the street, and hang out in the parking lot over on the other side. So, you know, this is why, you know, we have plans. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so don't be too bad because this was at a major hotel in downtown Phoenix. So. Well, you could um, stay by the pool. Yeah, right. Well, but that's another thing, you know, we talked about that too. 
And one of the guys there was a firefighter, and he said a lot of people think when there's a fire, like they found people dead in their bathtub because they go in their they go in their bathroom to run the water in the tub and think they're going to be safe. But the the heat is so intense that you actually die from steam. You actually die from burns oh because the God. water heats up so much that it just burns people to death. And that's how they find people in bathtubs and showers so they think they're safe. So. I'm not sure if I'm jumping the floor or not. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, well, thank you all for, sh- for sharing all that. Um, Julie, why don't you go ahead and give your KAI update and what we're doing with the website and stuff, because I think that's important. Sure. So, <clears throat> um, so I, just as a general update, the Unite newsletter went out last week, and for the upcoming newsletter, we'll uh, be adding, you know, significant or um, mild dates to the newsletter indicating when upcoming due dates or meetings are. Um, so that will be something that's new to the newsletter for the next month. Um, and then just a general uh, shout out to submit content for the newsletter um, to Debbie by the first Wednesday of the month. So that would be February 7th. Okay. Um, and, and content could be anything from, you know, just sharing a story about something that the, you know, facility accomplished within the last month, any goals or successes or um, anything that you might want to share that would be of interest for, for the group to know. Um, and that includes any photos as well. I think, you know, any kind of content like that would be really great. Okay. Um, and then just as I noted that the uh, best practice report for emergency uh, preparedness is undergoing 508 compliance, so we hope to have that done by the end of the week. And then after that, um, we will go through the process of getting it uploaded to um, the UNITE website on cms.gov. Okay. And, and Julie, the best mm-hmm. tell, now, moving into this year, we'll have, when will our first best practice report be due then? Right. So for this new year, the, the next best practice report is due. Um, I mean, KAI needs to have it, you know, submitted to CMS by March 15th. So in terms of working with the Unite Group, um, you know, we'll have to have everything completed, you know, by the end of February. And so what we're doing at this point is the topic will be on uh, cultural um, cultural uh, humility and we'll be focusing on the training aspect of how our nursing homes uh, training their staff to be more culturally sensitive to um, the residents. And so we're right. kind of, KI is just doing some preliminary research on, on this topic, um, and then we will reach out to, um, this, to tribal nursing homes to participate in this series of interviews on the topic. Right. You know what would be good on that, Julie, is finding out how many nursing homes actually have, like, a cultural coordinator like we do that's actually a member of the tribe. Or is their ombudsman, like, a tribal member? That might be a good question. Debbie, what was the title? Uh, For the best practice report? No, just for the position you just talked about. Uh, either the uh, cultural coordinator, we have a cultural coordinator, Mary Bernice, she's a, a tribal member, and a, she's actually a teacher, and then uh, we have an ombudsman, and both those positions are tribal members, so that's why I wondered. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, Julie, when are we doing, when did we agree to do the webinars in 2018? May and July, right? Correct. Okay. So if you guys remember, kind of be thinking about your participation with the webinars. So our topics for this year are on the cultural humility, um, because Dr. Winchester and Dr. Lewis said it's not really cultural competency because you can't be competent in someone else's culture, but you can be aware and you certainly can be have a the right attitude (laughs) basically about it. Um, So I don't know where Dr. Lewis is, Melissa. You haven't heard from him, have you? Um, so here in Alaska this week, uh, where's my paper? We actually have a um, conference going on downtown at one of the uh, hotels. I can't find my paper. I just had it. Um, 
but I know yesterday he was doing a present a joint presentation with me at this conference. It's the Alaska Public Health uh, Summit, I believe. Okay. So yeah, he was at that, and I know there were different breakout sessions. So that's probably where he's at. But I have not okay. heard from. I, I think he just forgot because he had a great to talk on today's call. So I think he might have just forgot. Um, I did send him a reminder at the beginning of the month and some information. I probably could have sent him an email yesterday just to remind him. But um, so our webinar for May will be on cultural humility, and then our second topic is on sustainability. And that's where if I think Ron might still be out of town, but Ron Roth agreed after our December call to kind of. On each one of these calls, give us a little bit of, kind of like talk a little bit about the financial end of, of nursing homes, of tribal nursing homes, and, you know, how funding streams work and all that kind of stuff, just to kind of increase our knowledge on this. I know there's been some good long-term support service webinars um, that I think those are, that one from last September is available, right, Julie, on CMS.gov? Um. Yes, it should be. Because that was real. What was her name again? Do you remember the name of the speaker last September? Um, she was really Elena, good. Elena C. Elena C. C. Yeah, she was really good. So if you want to see that recorded webinar on the CMS.gov where our site is housed, she was, that was worth watching. That was in September. Yeah. Actually, Debbie, um, there was some misinformation in that webinar, and so CMS oh, elected good. to not have it. Um, posted on the web on the website. That's so interesting. Did they say what it was that was not correct? Um, they did not. They didn't um, share that with us. Wow, that's interesting. That's oh, wow, that's very interesting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. See, I probably didn't know enough to pick that up. <laughs> that's interesting. So. May's topic is cultural humility, and July's topic is sustainability. So, again, you know, we want to be – so that's a good point, Julie. I mean, we want to be accurate, too. So when we talk about things or share things, you know, it's like our, our feeling was we wanted to come from a grassroots kind of, this is what we know, this is what we do. But we certainly don't want to share something that's not a best practice or encourage, you know, or share misinformation. So – Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, you always want to kind of fact check and talk to people. Um, I did want to mention quickly, Julie. Well, let me let you finish first. Is there any? Let me. Was there anything else? I'm just trying to think. Um, you no, know, those were just the, the the high points that I wanted to to mention today. Were just about the newsletter and the best practice reports, and then you know the upcoming um, you know topic and how we'll be working reaching out to folks to see if they would participate in an interview. Okay, great. And that will be sometime in February, right? Yes, yeah, so it will be, be coming up pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, I think okay. we may even begin to reach out starting next week. Yeah, well, and not too bad that we didn't get Jordan on the call today because that would have been a, help, a nice intro into that. But um, So just to mention on the TTI, the Tribal Technical Advisory Group, they did not have a meeting in, in January, right, Julie? Um, I think Jonathan m may be able to speak to that a little bit better. I'm not. Uh, Jonathan, uh, no, no, was there a but, TTAC call in January? Um, not that I'm aware of. I know a lot of the calls were canceled. Okay. Due to the holiday. And that was oh. yeah, the second Tuesday, right? It's supposed to be the second Tuesday? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so... I did get an email from John John um, that if they're going to survey the TTAG group and see what it is that, you know, like moving forward, what would be helpful to you. So I got that survey, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, I know that Joseph Ray also was going to try to be on those calls, so I made forward that and let him fill out that survey also. So at least we'll have some input into that. But I try to be on those calls on the second uh, Tuesday. But I, I know they didn't have one in December, and I didn't get any notice for one in January. So um, that's good. And I wanted to let you all know, I, I I was doing a little bit of research online, and I found um, this 
assisted um, author. She's actually a, a psychologist. Well, she's a PhD. I don't know if you've ever heard. It's a book she put out. It's called The Savvy Resident's Guide. Everything you wanted to know about your nursing home stay but were afraid to ask, you can buy it on Amazon. It's um, Eleanor Feldman, F-E-L-D-M-A-N, Barbara, D-A-R-B-E-R-A. And um, I took a look at the book. It's in large print, which which is kind of uh, interesting. She goes by Dr. L, E-L, Dr. L, and her website is mybetternursinghome.com. Um, and so, I mean, you're welcome to just kind of poke around the, nurse, the website, but as I was reading the book, I thought, you know, it would be neat, and I talked to Dr. Lewis about this, and he thought, Jordan thought that would be a, kind of an interesting idea when we talked about cultural humility, if maybe we could put together like our own little savvy residence guide, you know, like some kind of little booklet or pamphlet that just says, hey, welcome to a tribal nursing home, you know, Here's some things you might want to know before you before you come. And so, for example, some of her chapters are uh, what to expect upon your arrival, uh, working with the staff, managing your medications, uh, the relationship with the doctor, what can rehabilitation do for you, um, the dietary department, and that might be a good chance to slip in some stuff on traditional food, um, the social worker. How do you how do you complain about something? What about your belongings? What about your money? What about activities? What about your family? You know, what about discharge going home? So, I mean, I don't know what y'all think about that, but I I just thought, you know, with all our expertise on this collaborative, we could probably put something together pretty pretty good that could be used by all tribal nursing homes. What do you what do you guys think about that idea? Well, I'm in work now at two. Uh, they're com- completely different. Archie Hendricks is completely different than Laguna. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it's a good idea, but I think that, uh, you know, we need to hear more from other facilities and see what they're doing. And, you know, you'd have to do a lot of research on that, I would I would imagine. Right. Well, I think it would be a combination, and Melissa, you can begin. I understand that we're very diverse, and we're in different parts of the country, different weather, different activities. I don't think it would be like us trying to orient a resident to our facility, but rather to say, you know, in general, you know, here's, and it might kind of help explain some of the guidelines that we have to work with and regulations, you know what I mean? in a nice way so they understand that sometimes what we're doing is not because we're just being mean, but, you know, we have to account for what we're doing too. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe somehow create like a nice little way to frame that up. I mean, if you look at her book, you can get her book online. It was like eight bucks or something. You can kind of see like she frames it up in a pretty nice way and she gives little examples of, you know, times where she's interacted with residents. And so we could maybe have, like, a basic framework and then kind of put in little examples. Like, for example, at Laguna Rainbow in, you know, Albuquerque, you know, they do this. You know, this is what they do given their tribal, you know, their their tribal customs and, you know, whatever. Uh, the food they have available or whatever. We could maybe give examples. And it could also serve as a way to kind of promote what we do a little bit, too. Mm-hmm. I think by starting with to see what facilities do have a cultural liaison, um, and there they would be a good source on what's really happening and what cultural and traditions they follow and on what they don't, and you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the complexities that we face here in Alaska, and it's probably um, you know throughout Indian country, is in one specific region where a tribal nursing home is located, it doesn't necessarily mean that... Um, so, like, let's say Kotzebue, for instance, it doesn't mean that only um, the Inupiaq people would be um, at that facility. There could be, you know, a diverse population. Mm-hmm. 
first name mm-hmm. for Nome and Bethel. Yeah. Right. And that, I mean, you may actually see that happening more often. It's kind of interesting, but I'm sure you all saw that. Maybe you didn't, but there was something on Unite talking about, you know, what's happening and, you know, predicting what's going to happen with nursing homes down the road. It doesn't sound real positive, but, you know, I mean, they said basically, you know, the feeling I got after I read the article was that the really good nursing homes are going to survive. And I think, you know, really... um, I think that's partly when I read that, I thought, well, that's what our collaborative is about. You know, we want to get people on board saying, you know, we want to be the very best, right? We want to, so that's why we have our QIOs involved, even though they haven't been on the call. But, you know, that's why we initially invited them and why Keith came to our annual meeting is, you know, they have a stake in this too. They want to see us succeed and get better and do better. So, for example, yesterday I was on the call for the... um, our QIO is uh, the Health Service Advisory Group, and they had a call yesterday, and they gave us our, the results of the C. diff initiative. So some of you know that about 400 nursing homes in that QIO across to Ohio, California, Florida, Arizona, and the Virgin Islands have been reporting every month their C. difficile, their bacteria, you know, where people get diarrhea, <laughs> and they've been reporting that. And so they were able to finally tell us after 10 months what the rate is. Well, okay, Florida, California, Ohio, and the Virgin Islands all had C. diff rates in last 10 months of last year of less than one, pretty much. Now, ours in Arizona was two point something. So, I mean, we really stuck out like a sore thumb. But again, you know, it gives us, you know, a point to say, hmm, okay, well, you know, this is why we partner with our QIOs, right? So we can kind of be aware of what those trends are and what we might need to be, to be looking at. Um, in terms of getting better. So I just kind of threw that out there because that was some new data that just came out yesterday. But um, So, I mean, is there anyone on the call that would be opposed to maybe looking at something like this, like some kind of a little book or pamphlet and, you know, that might address kind of tribal nursing homes? Anyone opposed to that idea, if it's done correctly? I, I'm not opposed to it, but... I think it's, I, I think maybe a starting point is what Sheila said, like we really need to talk to maybe a tribal liaison for me or have like a little, I don't know, Julie, is this something you could help us with? Could KAI help us with this? Where if we kind of got the basic format down that we could reach out to maybe like a little panel of people in that tribal nursing home area and kind of, you know, get a little feedback of things we might want to add to the discussion. I mean, can you guys help us with that if we try to put together a little pamphlet or book of some kind? Um, I think if, um, I think uh, Jonathan and I would have to, you know, review what's in the the scope of work for for KAI in terms of what we do for CMS. Um, Mm -hmm. But my initial thought is if we were to frame this as a best practice report, um, maybe that's something that we could do. I think so. Okay, like kind of a best practice guide for those who might be entering the nursing home. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, yeah I think so, that's probably the best way to frame it. Okay, and then um, I'm wondering if CMS, they publish, right? They actually publish pamphlets and stuff, right? Um, Deb, Archie Hendricks has a, a, a wonderful little pamphlet that uh, Mary has in regards to you know, the um, cultural uh, ways on a nursing home. It, it's, have you seen it? It's a, and it is published by CMS. It's like a little pocket brochure. It's oh, really that's funny. neat. I have that in my, yeah, I have that right here. Um, it's not, I think it, I don't know if all the nursing homes even use that. I mean, I never saw that at Laguna. Um, it's actually... It, um, I know what you're talking about. It's the culture card, a guide to build, a guide to build cultural awareness. Correct? Yes. American Indian Alaska Native. Yes. So this is a joint effort between the CDC, CMS, uh, Indian Health Service, and the um, SAMHSA, which I should know by now because I use them all the time. It's the uh, South 
whatever it is. It's a mental health service. So it's a joint effort, and I think the copyright on this, she handed this out in 2010. It's copyrighted August 2010. It's been out for a while, cause, mm-hmm. and it's in English and Spanish. It's actually Department of Health and Human Services, publication number SMA 08-4354. Um, we can look it up. But, yeah, something like, I was thinking maybe something a little more than this, but it wouldn't have to be, Sheila. It could be something like this. Specific mm-hmm. ticket trust training home. So that's a good thought. We could maybe um, somehow uh, mimic it after, you know, kind of model it after that. Yeah. I think I think my point is that I don't know what, uh, having been at Laguna, I, I don't know what's available as resources. And I'm learning that there's a lot more available now that I'm at Archie Hendricks. Yeah. And that's, I think partly um, that's what this collaborative is about, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that was the whole thought about this, you know, is, is really talking and sharing and learning and, you know, saying, oh, I didn't know that, you know, and I'll make that phone call and I'll reach out to that person. And, you know, that's how we got to do a poster presentation at the NCAI Mid-Years Conference because, you know, Joseph knew somebody and they were willing to have us come and then... We got there and we met other people that, you know, were like, were connected. So, you know, I think that, that that's the strength of what we're doing here. I almost feel like we need like a membership drive, you know, <laughs> where, and I'd be willing to do it, to sit down and make phone calls to the current administrators or executive directors or whatever the point of contact is at, at the other facilities and give them a, uh, an education over the phone and, and encourage them um, because the membership that we have is pre- is pretty low. Right, um, and that's honestly been, it, it, there's been times where we've had 10 or 12 people on these calls and there's times where we've had one or two. And mm-hmm. it's, 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 you're right, it's difficult. We try to keep it consistent because we, we felt like if we kept changing the time and the day and whatever, We'll lose people, you know. So we've had our annual meetings, kind of, I hate to say, come hell or high water, but kind of, because it, it, we really felt like we needed to have that consistency, because otherwise people go, oh, well, some years they meet and some years they don't. Some years they do this and some years they don't. We didn't want to be like that. We wanted to have this consistent form, you know, and, you know, we're all kind of doing it out of the goodness of our heart, because <laughs> we all have jobs. But, I mean, if you're willing to do what you just said, Sheila, I think that's, I think that'd be great. I mean, what does everyone else think? Did everybody fall asleep? Everyone's still there? Melissa? Are you guys still still here? there? What do you think about what Sheila just said? I think it would be very beneficial. One of the things that um, just in working in long-term care in different capacities um, in the last 17 years um, is to get the perspectives from the the nurses' aides or the personal care attendants, whatever their titles are, the ones who are actually providing that direct care. Mm -hmm. Um, Not necessarily from the nurses, you know, maybe some of the nurses, but I think getting the perspective from the... The, the ones who actually, you know, have seven to ten um, elders that they, you know, have to help with activities of daily living um, and, and different stuff. I think getting their perspective would help make this a strong document. Okay. And I agree. And that's one reason why I had invited uh, to the Unite meetings our director of nursing and uh, our medical records person came and they were very excited and um, to to learn that this coalition existed. But I think you're right. You need more input from all levels of, of right. care. And um, Sheila, I, I appreciate because at the Unite meeting, Sheila did. She brought two people with her from Laguna, which was wonderful, and including the DON, which is really good. And so um, but I think we're talking a little bit about two things. The culture card, I think Melissa was kind of referring to that. Sheila, the, you know, getting the DNA feedback, but then also, oh, the, okay. I think there was a little crossover there, but that's okay. On the Unite membership, where you're talking about kind of a membership drive, I think reaching out 
to, we, I mean, Julie, we have all our facilities listed with a phone number and a, a current administrator, correct? Correct. Mm-hmm. I mean, if Sheila's willing to do this, she can reach out because she's an administrator, so perfect. She can reach out right administrator to administrator and say, we'd like to have you, your ADON, your HR person, your educator, whoever. I mean, it doesn't matter to me, your ombudsman, who's your QIO, could we reach out to your QIO? Let's get these people coming on board, you know? Let's get mm-hmm. them calling me. Let's get the conversation going here. I mean, there's work to be done. That's kind of my philosophy, you know? <laughs> like, um, so I think it's great, Sheila. I really appreciate your saying that because I know you've got a full plate right now. So, um, I mean, could, Julie, could you connect with Sheila, please, um, mm-hmm. after this, or maybe in the next couple of days, and just get her a list or somehow do that? And if Sheila can start reaching out between now and our next call, which is not until February, it's February 15th, so we got a little bit of time, okay? Um, so I know we're getting low. We don't have a QIO update because no one's on the call, but I told you what happened at our QIO meeting yesterday, so at least you have that information. Um, they're very active right now. The QIOs are very active right now with antibiotic stewardship. And also with the um, hospital-acquired infections, you know, preventing that, that that's going to be a real big uh, push in, in 2018, so you can definitely look for that. Um, let's see, is there anything else? We don't have Ron on the call, we don't have an ombudsman on the call, and we don't have an assisted living manager on the call. So is there anyone else with new business? Anything I missed, Alyssa? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Did we ever get a hold of Gerald? How's Gerald doing up in Bethel? Because we're talking about Gerald. getting him on the steering committee. Yeah, I have not heard from Gerald, nor have I heard from uh, anyone from Norton Town or from Nome. Okay. Um, I know that I do, like, one of the things in one of the um, struggles that I have with the Rural Elder Services Network is um, is their schedule availability? You know, like they say yes, they may you know attend this teleconference that I have once a month, but their priority is you know their facility. So if they have some emergent situation occur at mm-hmm. uh, the teleconference, they just you know send an email either before or afterwards saying why they couldn't participate. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's, to be honest, I, you know, with education and training, it's like that sometimes too, right? I mean, Sheila might have the best intentions and want to come, but, you know, if she gets a complaint from the family or something and has to deal with it, she may, that's a priority. So, I mean, doing things where it can be recorded and listened to afterwards can be helpful. Now, Julie, these calls are recorded though, correct? Correct. So all of our, not the steering calls, but these calls are recorded and put on CMS.gov. So people could actually go on there and, and you know, click on that and listen to the call. It's like an audio thing. So, you know, we do have that. So even if people can't actually, you know, oh, darn, I missed the Unite call. Well, okay, go on CMS.gov and let's start using the technology we have to, to stay up with, with things. So that's definitely available. Um, and I don't know if you could... Maybe I'll send uh, Gerald another email to see, you know, what his availability is. Yeah, that would be great. And um, so what I was going to say is with your your teleconferences, are they recorded? Because if you housed them somewhere, maybe people could watch them later. Um, So they're just audio teleconferences. Um. There's no video included, and I can check with our telecom department to see if we can record them for future reference. But I do send out minutes um, shortly after to the to the group. Yeah, yeah, and that's helpful too. That's helpful too if people would read the minutes too. And if, and if people like me would actually find them and do them. <laughs> I'll find them. I remember writing them out, and I know where they were the last time I saw them, so I'm sure I'll find them. Okay, is there any other comments? Because we're at 12.59. Anybody else? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. I hope that was helpful to everyone. Um, I appreciate your willingness to volunteer and your contributions, and uh, hopefully we'll have a few more people on the February call, Sheila, if we can recruit a few more administrators. I'm going to try. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everyone.